coming again. So in the midst of that moment of worship, we come to praise you for this hour. Father, we thank you for this time in which we celebrate again and again the Christmas journey, the journey of God to us, that we are thy way with children, that we are the sheep of your pasture, that you come seeking us. More than we ever seek God, he seeks us.
my voice holds out. It's getting real shaky right now. <laughs> Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Then also we're going to turn to Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace shall there be no end upon the throne of David, and upon his kingdom to order it, and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Then the last one, Micah 5, 2. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, through thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. from Luke 2, 1 through 7. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. 
And this taxing was first made from Cyrenius, was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one unto his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. ago when we first began uh, this service it was uh, it seemed as though in, in my mind at least and I, I I'm the pastor that um, a decision needed to be made as to what we were going to do with the offering this evening and, and it, it seemed to me as though it, in this time in which we are giving gifts to uh, to each other and we're giving gifts to uh, to those who are precious and dear to us, that it ought to be in our hearts that we would give away from ourselves, that we would give to, uh, to Compassion Ministries. I don't need to tell you that at, uh, at this time of the year, that, uh, that in the warmth and the comfort of this sanctuary, and in the warmth and comfort of your home, and with all of the gifts around us, and all of the gifts that have been given to us, there are still... There are still hungry people. There are still people around the world that are in desperate situations. I'm glad to be a pastor in the Church of the Nazarene. We have some 600 missionaries out there around the world from Central America, South America, Africa, India, the islands of the sea, uh, all around the world, into Russia, into Eastern Europe, into, uh, into Europe itself. We have missionaries there, and they are looking for ways in which they can help the community. And we provide them. I give beyond myself, I give as you do, to someone who is in desperate need. And so in this moment, if the ushers will ready themselves, we'll receive a compassion ministry offering for those beyond. This is not for this church of the Nazarene. Every cent that comes in is going to go out to somebody out there in the mission field and to whom we give our best and our love and our care and pray our prayers we give as unto the Lord. So gentlemen, will you come and wait upon us? And as we give, open our hearts to the offertory as well as you listed in the, uh, in the bulletin this evening. Glad to have some guests with us tonight. And uh, uh, Scott McMahon, the pastor of the Zealy and Opal Church, is back there. And I'm going to ask if he would pray for the offering at this time, if you would, Pastor. Father, again, Father God, again, once we thank you for the worship, we thank you for the gift that you give us.
And again, we'll read from Luke 2, 8 through 20. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on, pe and, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known to us. <clears throat> And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they heard it wondered at those things which they were told by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. this morning that uh, the great miracle of the incarnation is a mystery that God was born and came among us and so in these few moments uh, this evening I would just like to share with you some of the questions that are, that are in the midst of it questions that certainly that are part of, of our journey together who when where? How come? You know, why? Those are questions. They, they begin to us and share with us in these moments. In these moments, uh, before we get to them, I, I would tell you that someone was born just six months before this, and his name was John, John the Baptist. His parents were asked, why wasn't his name Zacharias like his dad? But the answer came back, his name is John. He shall be the, the, foretold, the, the foretolder, the, the word before the coming of the Lord. And so in the midst of this, we come to all these questions. As most of you know, I, I spend an inordinate amount of time in the hospital, in visitation. And I'm, I'm often asked, uh, uh, in, the, in outpatient surgery especially, the doctor comes in and says, you know, to the patient, how you doing? You ready? You're all set? We're going to go to surgery? Or we're going to go to this procedure? And the doctor says, do you have any questions? And the, uh, the patient nervously says, no. <laughs> and then they turn to the family and they say, you have any questions? And they say, no. And then they turn, he doesn't turn to me. But I'm sitting there and I say, I have some questions. And uh, I said, most of them are theological. But uh, and then they, the, the, my humor is lost on them. <laughs> you remember that uh, in the Peanuts uh, cartoon years ago, uh, Charlie Brown is, is going down the street holding a sign saying Christ is the answer. And, uh, and that's the first panel. Uh, a panel or two later, uh, his, uh, his dear friend Linus com is coming along with a sign saying, what is the question? <laughs> what is the question? If Jesus is the answer, what is the question? And so here we are this evening. We come to the sense in which the Bible story, beginning in Genesis and going from Genesis all the way to Revelation, is seeking to answer that question, seeking uh, in four or five different ways. I, I sometimes ask myself, if it's good, 
or is it bad? Is it um, new? Is it perfect? Is it good? And, and in the book of Genesis, God said he made everything, and when he made it, everything was good. And then the fall came, and everything that was good went bad. And we find ourselves in the midst of that this evening. Uh, the, the, what is new is, is the sense in which what brings us together this evening. Uh, some people say to me in the hospital or in the, along the road of life, what's new, Pastor? I pause for a moment and I say, last I checked, it was a testament. New testament. A new word from God. A new invitation to fellowship and to grace and to care. He comes with good and he comes realizing the bad. He comes in the midst of all of our struggles, all of the mess, all of the pollution, all of the difficulty of our lives, all of the, the back loss and the brokenness of our lives. I've, I've never preached at a, at, a, at a pulpit that ran away from me so swiftly as this one. But I, in this, uh, in this moment in which we come, in this wonderful time of the year, this most wonderful time of the year, as the songwriter says, there's still stress, there's still pain, there's still a time in which we struggle, and you may be lonely tonight and lonely remembering someone who was near and dear to you, somebody who you have lost, some bereavement, some loss and struggle in your life. We used to in the in the in the sanctuary. I think it's out in the garage now. And I, I, if I'd have planned a little bit more for this service, I would have dug it out and brought it in here. It's called a manger. It's made of wood. It's just a rough manger. When uh, the scripture was read to us a few moments ago, when Jesus was born, Mary laid him in a manger, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, wrapped him in cloth, and laid him in a manger. If, if, if most of what happens in the scripture sometimes has another message as well, because some 30 some years later, he was to be wrapped in cloth and laid in a tomb upon his death. He, he, is, uh, he is laid in the manger because the manger is made of wood. Uh, I, I heard the other, somebody tell me the other day they came upon a, a bumper sticker on the car in front of them and they had to come up close and, uh, and, the, uh, and the word was on the bumper sticker something to the effect of, of uh, love a tree, love a tree. You know, I'm sure I, I've had some trees in my life. I got one on my right here. But, but, but trees are not the answer. You know, something else is the answer. And um, the wooden, the wooden cradle, the wooden manger becomes a wooden cross years later. To remember that he came, he came among us at this time of the year. He came among us at Christmas time. He came among us to die. He didn't live a very long life, but he came to bear our sin and to carry our rebellion and to carry all of the mess and squalor and indifference and all of the dirt of our lives. He carried every failure that is, that is ours. He carried them in himself. Surely he has borne our sins and carried our sorrows. And when he is born, he is born to die. And he can among us to become to become like us and to become in our sin there's um, when we come to Beth Bethlehem uh, there's, a, there's several conflicting areas the questions that struggle in our lives is that when we come to Bethlehem to find the Savior we find that in the midst of it he is rejected he's rejected by Herod and Herod seeks to kill all of the little boys in Bethlehem 
He comes to bring release to us. Release from the struggle and the pain of life, from the sin that doth so easily beset us. He comes to give a relationship to us. He comes to be our Lord. He comes to be among us in fellowship. And the story of Christmas is the story not only of Christmas, but of Easter. And in between these two Christian holidays is the journey that we begin together. At Christmas, that this sense in which this, this, my sermon, my pulpit goes away from me again, pull it back and focus again, and the, uh, Every year at, uh, at September, uh, for a number of years, uh, there, there was a pastor's conference. Actually, it's a pastor's retreat. It's down in the hills, down, down Pleasantville, down the Mennonite Center down there. And uh, for a number of years, my wife and I went to it. And, and, uh, and then she was gone. And I didn't go for several years. And a friend of mine is um, uh, pastoring on South Hills down in, in Pittsburgh. And uh, his wife didn't want to go. She had a responsibility. She was teaching. And she couldn't go. And so I, we were having to pass the moment. And he said, uh, why don't we go together? So we became kind of the odd couple at the pastor's and wives retreat. You know, Ken and I went together. We roomed, to, we roomed together. We shared together. We ate together. We talked together. And we had good fellowship. On Tuesday afternoon in the retreat, we begin Monday night and listen to a preacher, Monday night to meditation and fellowship and food. Tuesday morning at breakfast together, listen to the speaker again. Tuesday afternoon, so they told us, you're on your own. Go find a place. So we got in my car and we drove from that Mennonite Center, drove eastward to Somerset, up over the mountains into Somerset. And then, then turned north from Somerset and, and went, went to, into a little village up there in the mountains called Frieden. I think I pronounced that right. Frieden. And he said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to visit somebody. And Ken turned to me and said, who do you know in Frieden? And I'm, I said, I'm not sure I know that I could find them here. I pulled into the post office and went into the post office and I said to the, to the girl at the, at the counter, do you happen to know the Stotlers? Do you know Dale and Pat Stotler? Do you know that they live here? And she said, yeah, they live right up the street up here. They were just a second street on the right. And we, we, uh, we drove into uh, and we called their, their phone number and went in to see the... Uh, the Stotlers. You don't know them, but some of us Nazarenes knew them through the years. In fact, they lived here for about a year and a half while their kids were in high school. They, they were missionaries to Africa. They, they, they went to Africa. They, 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 they gave their lives to, to darkest black Africa. They, they went to Africa. And, and you would say, well, that was a wonderful, that was a wonderful just offering for them to do. What a, what a moment of sacrifice. And they would say, no, 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 it wasn't sacrifice at all. It was the will of God for them. And it was the most marvelous experience in their lives to give their lives to Africa. So we drove up to this little ranch house up in Freedom, up, uh, Freedom, uh, up there in, in the mountains uh, north and, and, uh, of, of Somerset. And we went in and sat in their living room and talked. And there was a glow about them. There were memories around them. There were all kinds of experiences in their lives. Pictures of Africa. Pictures of, of the people that they knew and loved. The churches that they had built. The, 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 the fellowship that they had developed. The people who they had met in their lives and in their journey. And in these moments, in those wonderful moments, I thought, what a wonderful way to live your life in the will and purpose of God. Now you say, I can't go to Africa. But let me tell you this, you can live in the center of God's perfect will. He 
has a plan for your life. And in that plan for your life is his perfect joy and fellowship and care and love. The second story, and the last story I'm going to tell you uh, this evening before we sing again, is that is on Tuesday night this past week, we went Christmas caroling. An old tradition. And I bring my pulpit back up to where I get in focus again. I, we went Christmas caroling. We went to Rochester Manor and, and sang for, and for a lady that comes into this church when she can in a walker. We went to, to Cambridge Village to somebody who gave life and love and, and, and gave fellowship and gave support to this congregation and who was a marvelous, marvelous lady in the Lord. And she's related to some of the folks here. And then we went down to Providence, down to the old Beaver Falls Hospital, which is now Providence. And we sang for a number of people in the hallway and in the activity room. Then we went down a side hall and we began to sing. There was a bunch of teenagers with us. Some of you that are here tonight may have been that, in that gang. There was a bunch of teenagers and some adults and some old people like myself. And we just sang. And we sang much, much of what we're just singing right now, Oh, Come All Ye Faithful. We sang Silent Night. We sang you know, Joy to the World. And we stood at the bedside of a lady who hasn't said a whole lot. A lady who has been quiet for a number of years now. Her name is Jeannie Lane, and she lived across the street from here. And while we were singing, while we were singing, she began to sing. She began to sing. She began to sing. And I, do you hear me? There was a sense in which, you know, here in memory, here in, in the subconscious of, of a dear lady's life who's playing out in, in, the, in the journey of life, not only the Stotlers who, would, in the energy of their life, gave their life to Africa, but somebody who gave their life to New Brighton and to this church and to your life and who prayed for you and remembered you. And she began to sing, she began to sing the Christmas carols with us. I, we, we're not, well, we, we're going to sing a verse of it. It is, uh, uh, I think they're going to put it up on the screen. It's uh, O Holy Night, and we're going to sing just quietly, uh, just as a prayer song, because this is, this is what, uh, what God has given us the privilege. Because I thought as we singing, as we were thinking about O Holy Night, I was thinking of the Stotlers and, and, uh, and how they gave their life and, and what had happened because they came. If I could take you, I, I, one, of the, one of the images that I had of, uh, of missionaries is a, is a missionary by the name of David Livingston. Most of you know the story that David Livingston went into Africa about a century and a half ago and disappeared. He went all, all over Central Africa, in the darkest Africa, Lake Tanganyika, up there towards the Congo, up, up through, up through those, those just black and, and darkened communities. And, and the, the New York Herald said, we got to find him because everybody wanted that. What in the world happened to David Livingston? And when, they, when, when Stanley got off the boat in East Africa and, and started up the, uh, the, uh, the river towards what he thought was Livingston's, he went from village to village to village. And what he found is that when he would come over the hill or come through the jungle and come through this terrible, terrible journey seeking David Livingston, he would come into a village that was different than every other village. It was clean. The people were different. They would, greet, they would greet him with a smile. They would greet him with joy. They would greet him with a sense that this was a, a good place to live. And, he, and through his translator, he would say, glad to meet you. And the answer was, Livingston was here. Livingston was here. And I want to say to you tonight that in, in villages in Africa and in New Brighton, and in these places, the Stotlers and Jeannie Lane were here. And, and we thank God for their love and their care. And we come on Christmas Eve to remember that he is here. 
the Lord himself had come among us. So and Merlene's going to pick it up, and uh, we're going to put it on the screen. Just the first verse, long lay the world. So let's sing the last verse. Truly he taught to love one. His blood, his love, and his gospel, his peace. month or the last quarter or maybe months ago in the spring or the summer 
But we come to, to bring our faith and our hope to God, that God's comfort and God's grace shall rest upon them and upon this congregation and upon these who come on Christmas Eve. We thank you that you are the Lord of life. In a few moments we shall light a candle in behalf of a, a brother or sister, a child, a parent, a grandparent, someone in our life that was near and dear to us and to whom in memory we come believing that they are with you, that you are still the savior of the world, that you are still the answer for all of our sorrow and all of our struggle and all of our pain, and that God is among us, Emmanuel. So for these moments, be among us, we pray, thankful for your love and care. We open our hearts to God and to each other, thankful that you're among us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Bruno's going to lead us in the first verse of Silent Night, and the gentlemen are going to come and help us as we pass the light to you at this time.